Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society, Buffalo, New York. This is the 26th of October, 2006, approximately 2.15 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you tell me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Charles L. Lumsden, L-U-M-S-D-E-N. Born in Buffalo, New York, April 2nd, 1920. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering the service? Well, I was a graduate of Lafayette High School, and I had a few semester hours at the Miller Fillmore College of the University of Buffalo. Okay. Nowhere near enough to graduate with. Mm -hmm. Do you remember where, where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was sitting in front of the radio on a Sunday afternoon. Do you remember your reaction when you heard about it? Oh yeah, I was quite indignant. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was? I had a little idea, yes. Okay, most people yeah. weren't sure at all where it was, okay. Um, did you uh, enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted the next morning. Okay. I tried to, but uh, the boot camp was full already. Really? And uh, in the East Coast, so they put me on standby. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until mid-January I finally got a call. I was being sent out to boot camp in San Diego, California. Not the usual Paris Island mm -hmm. or East Coast boys went. Now, why, why did you pick the Marine Corps? I thought I'd get the best training. It was an opportunity to finish the war alive. Okay. Um, how long was your basic training? Ten weeks. Now, did you uh, did you train out in the 1903 or the the ground? What did you use to train your weapon that you used to train out? Oh, Springfield out? 03. 03, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Did you have the old World War One helmets still? No. They, well, they had the new ones up by then. We had new ones. Mm -hmm. We uh, we had clean the old Cosmoline off those World War One rifles, which wasn't an easy job to mm -hmm. do. I imagine. The easiest thing to do was throw gasoline on it and burn it off, but that was not allowed. We had to take it off the hard way. Probably blow the place up. <laughs> when did you turn over to the M1? Do you remember? I never had the M1. You never, even no. when you were out. When I finished boot camp, we were all paraded and they asked if we would like any of us like to take a, go into aviation. About six of the 60 guys stepped forth, including me, because mm -hmm. they always wanted to get into aviation. Had you ever flown? No. Why, why do you think you wanted to be in aviation then? I don't know, probably glamorous and mm -hmm. much better. Yeah, I had an uncle who fought in the trenches in World War II, or through the World War I, my Uncle George. And um, he described the trenches, the life of the trenches in World War I, which is horrible. Mm -hmm. He said the aviators, they, they maybe died, if they did die, they died quickly. And they, they ate a good meal every night, slept in a clean, dry bed every night, mm -hmm. which appealed to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, where were you sent uh, for aviation training? To the North Island Naval Air Station, right across the harbor from where the boot camp was. I could see the planes over there when I was in boot camp. Mm -hmm. What type of aircraft did you train on? I never flew. I was, I went to, when I got there, I wanted to be a tail gunner, mm -hmm. which was madness, but I didn't know better at that time. But there was only one school open, that was Aviation Machinist Mate School in Chicago. Okay. I was a bank clerk, I was no mechanical aptitude whatsoever, but that's where I went. And I was spent six months in Chicago training to be an Aviation Machinist Mate. And okay. I had a ticket somewhere that said so, but I was this place that I wish I could find it. What was the training like? Uh, did you work on engines? Or? Yeah, very little. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was waiting, while I was at North Island, I was waiting to go to school. And uh, I was going to the Aviation Machinist Med School. And uh, there was a whole yard full of all the World War I and World War II airplanes there for us to play around with. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting, but I never touched a wrench when I left the school. That was normal in the morning. Uh -huh. People go to training and they don't use it. 
How long were you in Chicago? Six months. Summer of 42. Mm -hmm. Where did you go after, uh, after that? Back out to the West Coast. And I had a good buddy. He and I were assigned to uh, meet the train with Boys from the East, take him in uh, hand, get him what we called the 782 gear, which was their helmet, their belt, their beta. Put him on a ship and sent him overseas. After about a month of that, we decided we didn't want to stay stateside. We were going back overseas, <laughs> going overseas rather, and that's what we were signed up to do. So we uh, told the authority and we were whistled into a, a hangar with a, every, a next overseas contingent, and we uh, were on a ship the next day. We sailed 12 days from, New, from San Diego to New May and New Caledonia, which was to be our home base for 16 months. What were your duties there? Well, originally I was in what they call a bull gang, that is, whatever heavy work jobs had to be done, build roads, load planes, steel rail from the Army, so for our roads. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And I had a fateful day. You want me to tell you about this? Sure, yes. I found out that they were going to train the air navigators because they didn't have enough navigators. You'll find a little bit about this in there. We, um, my outfit that I was joined up with, Memory and Aircraft Group 25, was sent there because the Navy, lost, the Navy withdrew from the Solomon Islands and left the 1st Marine Division high and dry at Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm. The Corps responded by organizing Main 25, and they had 12 uh, DC-3s. I hopped across the Pacific to New Caledonia, set up camp, and began ferrying and bedding the supplies to the 1st Marine Division. Food, bedding, medicine, doctors, gasoline drums, toilet paper, bedding, there were some hectic times. Now, they didn't have any navigators. They had a few enough pilots. So the pilots had to do the navigating and this and which wasn't working out well. Because I had a little college and had a mathematical background, I was a clerk at the Federal Reserve Bank. They um, accepted me. I had a good IQ, too. Mm -hmm. 137, I think, was pretty good. So I was one of the 13 guys selected to go to that navigation school, but they said one of the pilots had been uh, graduated of the Weems School of Air Navigation at Annapolis, Maryland, and he was in control, in charge. And so we went to NAV school. Now where was that school located? Right in a couple of tents at the, on the base of Tom Tudor, where, where our camp was. Okay. How, how long did your training last? About uh, eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Then we flew piggyback with the other navigator until we got checked out. And then we were on our own. Okay. What rank were you at that point? Pardon me? What rank were you? Oh, I was a corporal. Okay. And uh, they gave me a rank every month for the four months later. I was a master sergeant. Oh. <laughs> In the peacetime Marine Corps, you'd be lucky to be corporal in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, do you want to talk about some of your missions? Well, our mission was uh, very simple. We, uh, we would either load up in New Caledonia or fly up to the Spirit of Santos, which was the big supply depot, and load up there. We'd leave the Spirit of Santos about uh, 2 in the morning, 2.30. Time to arrive at Guadalcanal at sunrise. Uh, we make a quick landing and get unloaded and get the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. Our return cargo in the early days when we wounded uh, most of them. Get them back down where they can get better hospital care. Mm -hmm. Did you always fly with the same crew? No, no. We didn't know who you were going to fly with until you saw it posted on the bulletin board in the morning and mm -hmm. check the schedule to see if you were flying that day. And with whom. Now, did you have air cover at all? No, very rarely. Mm -hmm. 
fact, we, what, we would, what they needed up there was fighter planes, and it was too long a haul from the Spirit of Santos to about uh, four hours for those guys to fly without a navigator. So they mm -hmm. would, we would have uh, maybe five or six fighter planes or dive bombers along with us to get them there. They just followed us uh, and very closely. Were you ever attacked by Japanese aircraft? No. We had a, our squadron motto was security in the wash, which in French means in clouds we trust. <laughs> we went hiding in clouds in Henderson Field, which is the main field in mm -hmm. the now. We were getting beaten up or patched up. We did you ever have trouble landing there? Because they were under fire quite often. Oh, the yeah, they did, but they, uh, we got out of there. And we, they, somehow the Japanese were in early morning rides, I think. They, we were tired most of our arrivals for about 7 in the morning. And uh, we couldn't gas up because the gas was very precious up there for the fighters and the dive bombers. So we would just uh, get out of there and get back down to the Spirit of Santos. It was a four hour ride. Mm -hmm. The DC 3s we flew in were a very good, reliable airplanes. And they had, but they had a, uh, well, they cruised at about 150 miles an hour. What was your living conditions like? Were you in like a Quonset hut or a... Or yeah, I got, a, I got out of a tent mm -hmm. into a Quonset hut when I began to get the navigation program. The, um, when they asked about a little humor there, I commented you'll find it. But we had a terrible wind up there one night and the uh, tents all blew away, most of them anyway. And here are a whole bunch of Marines running around at night in the dark trying to find it. Belongings in the tent. <laughs> now, did you ever suffer from any tropical diseases yeah, I like? Was called cat fever for about three or four days. What was that? Cat fever. Called cat fever. Okay. Kind of, uh, the ague was supposed to be. I feel a little chilly. And they put me in the hospital for three days. Mm -hmm. Drowned me. What were your Food, what kind of food did you have there? Did you pretty well supplied with food? Uh, we had lots of food. What we would do, if we had time, we would maybe base about three miles down the road, we'd go down there and have our dinner there. Mm -hmm. They had pot roast of beef, apple pie, and ice cold lemonade. We had coffee, we had a sausage, and scrambled eggs. Green eggs, you know, mm -hmm. What did you do for when you weren't flying for entertainment? Did you? Have well, we had we were very fortunate. Our camp was alongside the town to the river, which was about as wide as the Ellicott like Creek. Mm -hmm. We came down off the mountain. The water was clear and sweet and pure, and we swim and relax. We come back for a three or four day trip and take a swim in that nice, cool, clean water. It was very, very nice. Now how many, how much, how large was your unit? How many, what was the size of the personnel? Well, I'm not sure it was a count. I think that the peak that probably had 2,000. Mm -hmm. We had a uh, service squadron, a, uh, uh, three operating squadrons, one of which was an army squadron. I was in bank 25, 253, excuse me, I was in 253. Well, did Japanese, Japanese ever attack your base? No. Well, we had foxholes and we were all ready for them. They never came. Hmm. I wonder about that myself. Yeah. Because they came to the Spirit of Santos and of course they hit Guadalcanal virtually every night for a long time. They had a, a two uh, engine bomber called a Betty. And they sent one of them over at night to get us out of bed because when the radar picked up that we were going to have a hostile mm -hmm. by the man condition red, we all had to get out of bed and get in a foxhole. They called a washing machine Charlie. The washing machine Charlie had a, a weird engine sound because they don't pick them up. Mm -hmm. You know they weren't out of you heard them. Did you? Uh, oh yes. yeah. 
And did you? was in Guadalcanal knew what we were through Charlie. And there was pistol P over the mountains. Was there? Right, was there? Can. Did you uh, get to see any USO shows or any entertainers at all, like Bob Hope uh, or? Oh, yeah. Was it Harry, Harry James? No. Married a Harry Gardner. He was married to uh, uh, one of those. Who did she marry? The band leader, Artie Shaw. Artie Shaw, Shaw. yes. Yeah. Well, um, after Guadalcanal was secured, what were your duties? Well, uh, we probably got home just after it was secured. And uh, we uh, started moving to Bougainville. And uh, yeah, we got to Bougainville, I was sent home in November, and Bougainville really started to roll in November. But I uh, did get one trip up north to a place called Ondanga, which is a small island near Bougainville, which they captured and used as a staging spot for the attack in Bougainville. Mm -hmm. Now, why were you sent home early? Was I was sent home because I had 400 hours. Oh, okay. And I'd been out there for 14 months. I'd flown over 100 sorties. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, I came up with the numbers. Did uh, they send you to a base stateside or were you oh, discharged? Yeah. So we flew You know, we, Lori and I have flown from Sydney, Australia to uh, San Francisco. Non-stop. Los Angeles was non-stop. It took us, we flew from New Caledonia to the Spirit of Santos, to Fiji, to Samoa, to Canton, to Palmyra, and finally to uh, Iwa, the big green base on Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Big old week. A lot of us were Then I got a, a ship back to the United States after that. Now, what were your assignments in the States? Well, I was assigned to the we decided to have a navigation school stateside. Mm -hmm. And the guys from our outfit as they got home were assigned to the nav school. So I was assigned to the navigation school. And uh, I found that I was recommended for a commission. And we were the only other, the other, the other the 13 guys that well, including me. I flunked the physical. I had hypertension, I never knew that. So anyway, uh, it was very hard for me to uh, see these guys, some of whom I helped get through the NAMP school, uh, running around with the second lieutenant bar. Mm -hmm. But what did happen was, I was, they kept me stateside, maybe nine commissioned officer in charge of the navigation school. And that's where I finished the war. Do you remember where you were in your reaction when you heard about President Roosevelt's death? No, I don't remember that. Okay. How about the dropping the atomic bombs? Do you... Well, we heard about that. Mm -hmm. We were all very happy. I was terrible on the Japanese, but most of us were aware of the fact that they were going to invade the homeland. They were going to. The navigation school was going to be shut down, and every Marine body available would be used because they were going to be expecting heavy casualties. Mm -hmm. And highs of million men. Yeah. A lot of guys running around this country today whose fathers would have been, never made it. Mm -hmm. And some of them are the guys that are complaining about the atrocious you know, atomic bomb, you know, which you got to weigh the end of the balance. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other stories you want to mention that you recall that happened to you? Well, we made some good friends. Mm -hmm. I've lost all of them. Were there any that you stayed in contact with after oh, yes. the war? Yes, we had a reunion every year for years, mm -hmm. and uh, we went to many of them. The Buffalo couple, a fellow that I met overseas, in fact, uh, began. Uh, I heard somebody talking about Utica Street, but I stuck my head in the tent and said, "Who the hell is talking about Utica Street?" Here? Fellow that Bob began, who began very good. I was the best man when they got married in the park. We were stationed up in Corvallis, Oregon for six months. Mm -hmm.
to the middle of the school. The Corvallis was an idyllic place to be, but the weather was too bad to fly the planes constantly, a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. So they moved it down to El Centro, California, where it never rains. That's what the last year we were in El Centro. 110 at midnight. Mm -hmm. Did you ever use the GI Bill? What? The GI Bill. Did you oh, use it? Well, that's a sad story. I tried to. My father was dying of cancer. And I was enrolled in the degree program. But I decided to drop out for six months to be with him. I knew he was the last much longer. And unfortunately, if you dropped out and went to enroll after that, um, six months, you were uh, out for the program. Mm -hmm. I tried like hell to get back on it again, but I couldn't do it. So I wanted to pay my own fees. Did you ever use the 5220 club? No, no. I was the right to work for the bank in Chicago when I got out. Okay. Um, the internal auditor was the bank there. Mm -hmm. Is that where you went after you went into banking? Well, I went, in, didn't, I went into banking, yes. Mm -hmm. But I was only working, going back to work for the Federal Reserve Bank that I worked for in Buffalo. But the Fed system is such that the banks are not related. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing they did was uh, check with the Buffalo people who were a honest, hard working boy, you know. And they hired me right off the I still wore my uniform for a month after I went to work there. With the ruptured deck on it. Mm -hmm. the, um, and I decided to go back to Buffalo, which was a fortuitous thing because uh, I enrolled in a degree program at UB. I got a good job here, paid much better than the bank did. And uh, I got a good, good accounting experience, so I decided when they moved from the firm I was working for. Moved from Buffalo to Canandaigua. I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay close to UB. And I had doing a little part time accounting work on my own. So, with a very thin number of clients, I ran an office at the uh, Rand Building for 62 bucks a month. First month, I only took in 50. But I enjoyed being on my own very much. Mm -hmm. And things moved along very well. Today, this firm that I retired from has 90 people working for it. No. Did you join any veterans organizations? No. Never did. No, I never did. Uh, well, I belonged to the 48 Club for a year. There was only a knife and fork group that really didn't do anything else. <laughs> so I didn't really know that. So. How do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Greatly. In what ways? Well, when you go through boot camp, you figure you're as good as any man and better than most. A real, a real ordeal. And uh, I learned to be in charge of people, command a very good sized group of Marines at the navigation school. And uh, we were kind of loose, but uh, we did a good job. And it taught me leadership, and it taught me respect for authority. And I think of the probably the most biggest disappointment of my life was not getting that commission. I mm -hmm. wanted that badly. I was still trying to get it when the war ended. I might have got it back today. I ran to my old colonel. He said, Lumpton, how came you went from one of the other guy? I said, oh, I flunked him physical. But he called up the base doctor. Sent him over, I'll put him in the bed, we'll take his blood pressure in the morning. <laughs> it was perfectly normal. And, but uh, the paperwork never caught up with it. It's, uh, there's this little rationalization about that situation. We lost my brother in World War II. He was killed in the pilot. Killed on the D-Day, flying troops, paratroopers. Oh, a DC-3 then also? Yeah. And uh, I was the only other boy in the service. My other brother, the third brother, was only eight or nine years old. So uh, if I had been lost, uh, there would have been complete wipeout for me. So looking at it that way, so a lot of the guys that went back out the second time are still out there. Mm -hmm.
Now you've got a, a photo there and an article. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, if he if holds that, hold I that, can... He'll, he's going to focus in on your photograph. Oh, okay. Just hold it like that. Now, do you know when that was taken? About when? This picture? Of yes. I was in Chicago. Was it was in 1942. 42, okay. It looks a little younger. A little bit. Huh. I can see you, though. Uh -huh. Is there a story behind that, the night we almost splashed the general? Oh, yeah. You want to read it? Well, Don't can you briefly it. just tell us about it? Well, I'll read it to you. Oh, it would make more sense. It takes me a couple of extra minutes. It's up to you if you want yeah. to. Okay. okay. During World War II, I served as a aerial navigator with the Marine Air Crew 25, also known as South Pacific Combat Air Transport. Bracket. SCAT scan. After the initial landings on Guadalcanal in August 1942, the 1st Marine Division became stranded. When after the disastrous battle of Sable Island, the Navy deemed it necessary to make a strategic withdrawal from the supporting supply and combat, combat ships. This action left the Japanese in control of the sea and the Marines high and dry. The Corps responded immediately, organizing 1945, and by mid October of 1942, the first elements left San Diego in the form of all special credit Douglas C transports, known as naval aviation as our authority in three months. These planes island hop across the Pacific to town through the New Caledonia, some 900 miles southwest of Guadalcanal, using the airfield there as the base of the area of the Indian Harrison Field and Guadalcanal, which desperately needed supplies of aviation, gas, toilet paper. Food, ammunition, bedding, medical supplies, key personnel. And on a return trip, usually evacuating the worst cases of disease, wounds, and combat fatigue. It was often necessary for an unarmed, unescorted transport plane to lurk in clouds nearby when anything was being either beat up or patched up. So eventually, a group motto we clouds. Clouds we trust. General Vanderbilt, USMC, overall commander on the Guadalcanal during the hectic days, commented during the post war meeting with our former commanding officer. Without your fellows, we could have done it, end of quote. Finally, as the battle for the Solomons, Southern Solomons was successful in sea control, we established SCAD Operation Common South Africa as a glorified airline for the Southwest Pacific Combat Area. In October 1943, I was assigned to a crew order to the Royal New Zealand Air Force Base at Canoe Heights, some 20 miles from Auckland, where we were to stand back for further orders. My instructions were to touch base with the plane deck and each one of them let our Auckland hotel know where I was at all times. I was only one evening at the Devonport Hotel as the guests of the family were grand the establishment. And I received a phone call ordering me back to our hotel immediately. We were leaving. It was nearly midnight when we finally arrived at our Royal New Zealand Air Force base at Canoe Pine. For the full gale in progress, rain beat in the hangars, the building, visibility was practically zero, all in all, as far as you can imagine. I probably thought no one in his right mind would send a plane off on a night like this, when literally the birds were walking. However, being a Marine, I should have known better. We checked out my navigation, gave my operations out, and went to the ready room. We got the first of several shocks. The assembly, assembly was a large group of Marine Corps brass, including Major General, was I'd ever seen in one room until that time. Our pilot, Captain Thomas, advised me that our destination was to be sued in the Fiji Islands, some 1,100 miles almost due north. It wasn't until some time later they found that our duty was to fly Major General Julian Smith. U.S. Marine Corps. And his staff on the first leg of the journey to the Battle of Tarawa. We had a tough time just getting in the takeoff position, including getting st stuck in the mud next to the taxi runway. We finally got airborne sometimes after midnight, after prolonged the bumpy takeoff. The long, long night was ahead of us. In the early days of the war, the navigators used a combination of three methods of dead reckoning. Celestial observation, radio bearing, and the latter not very well being reliable beyond 
60 miles. And celestial answers, celestial observation. So it's sophisticated navigational aids as Loran, radar, and transponders were yet to come in the back 25. After a rough hour and a half of them, we cleared the bad weather in the New Zealand area and took my first star sights to obtain a celestial fix. Instead of the usual tiny transient, trying it on my chart, the fix encompassed almost the entire South Pacific area. In other words, it was a navigational aid that was useless. Assumption I had an instrument problem. I bore you guys with No, no. Assumption I had an instrument problem. The bubble of an octant we used at that time. The bubble of an octant we used at that time was an instrument sensitive instrument. Easily knocked out of calibration. Such occurrence had happened to my colleagues in the past. I notified the pilot of the problem we had a serious conflict. The extremely bad weather in the northern New Zealand area made it almost impossible to return safely, and also we had to consider the importance of our mission. As plane commander, it was Captain Thomas' decision, and he made it. We got together for lunch out in San Diego a couple of years ago and had a three hour lunch. Did you? <laughs> Captain Thomas made the decision we would go on. The main island of Fiji is Vitalovo, which is also the principal airfield are located. The main field still used today was Nandi, located on the west end of the island, and Suva, our destination, which is toward the east end. Due south of Vitalovo is the small island of Kanduru. I decided to set our course for the center of this island on the theory that if we got substantially off course, we would certainly brush one side or the other for the main island by using radio bearings when we got near enough. Find one of the airfield. Very informally, we had on board, very fortunately, we had on board an extra supply of drift bombs. These consisted of a small pointed object with a phosphorus tip, phosphorus tip which, when dropped in the sea, ignite, leaving a red glow at night or a plume of smoke in the daytime. Every 15 minutes or so, I dropped one of my means of our drift meter. I could peer through the hull of the plane down at the sea, line up the grid lines. With the flare below, and determine how many degrees of drift we had, and advise the pilot to correct our heading accordingly. The long night wore on. There were some interesting vignettes. The red-headed colonel came into the crew quarters after watching me work for a while. He leaned down and said very earnestly, "How old are you, son?" <laughs> I said I was 23. Later, I walked back to the head of the plane, to the head of the rear of the plane. And there they all were, draped over mail bags, luggage, sleeping, pretending they were, all except one. They had rigged up some kind of chair for the general, and there he sat, pulled upright, staring straight ahead, eyes wide open. He must have had a premonition that terror was going to be a terrible ordeal for his men. This is of the 2nd Marine Division. When daybreak came, I determined we should be near enough to try crossing the radio bearings from Sula and Nanny. Doing so, I found we were pretty well on course. I was feeling somewhat pleased with myself when I heard an excited yell from the cockpit. They were dead ahead, lying in the sea, looking like Valhalla itself in the morning sunshine with my little island of Kandura. With the mountains of Vita Labu looming in the distance, I then set a course change, calculated our estimated time of arrival, ETA. In a new course, we landed in a small grass field on Suva, some eight and a half hours after takeoff the night before. It was not a soul in sight to greet us. We sat under the wing, general and all, and waited. Finally, a jeep poked its nose around the hangar, spotted us, and came tearing up, picked up the general, a couple of others, and took off. The pilot came to me and complained that, I, that our ETA was a way off. I replied that it was on the button. Then it occurred to me, like a bolt in the blue, a chronometer. That sacred holy of holy, which is not supposed to be touched or removed from any protective protect case, which was said and calibrated by an expert at our home base navigation office, must have been an error. Chronometers are an integral part of the celestial observation calculation. They are constant at kind of simple time in the world order. However, someone in Willing, you know, Penup, excuse me. Someone back at Panuma Bay had set the chronometer back an hour because of a technical mistake for some bizarre reason, such as New Zealand with a one hour time difference from New Caledonia. It was my responsibility to determine somehow that the chronometer was an error. However, 
once the decision was made to continue on dead reckoning, I called upon my training, made the best of available resources, and divided the practical and conservative navigation plan, which was successful. Over the years, in retrospect, they were often wondered if we had been lost that night when terror off and fought as planned. But the commander and the staff and probably the battle plan was gone. Even though officers on more than two transports probably had duplicate plans with every ability to take over. But the Navy High Command had canceled a further attack on Tarawa in the circumstances. Veterans of May 25 had a reunion in San Diego to observe the 50th anniversary of our shipping out. Bob Thomas and I compared notes. One thing that he told me I had not previously known, we landed in Sula with about fuel tanks on the empty for the last 50 minutes of the flight. He said when his kids were young, well, they loved to hear the story of the night we almost splashed the general. <laughs> now, did you, either of you ever receive any recognition for that? No, do it please. Just do your job. Yeah. <laughs> no, nice. neither one of us ever got any recognition for that. In fact, I don't think if the general, uh, Smith, Smith, Julian Smith, yeah, we knew that he was in danger that night. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. Didn't care. I never did, didn't go with a general. We almost lost your butt today. <laughs> <laughs> now, you want to put that with those papers? Yes, again. yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for your interview. Pleasure.